And we are back, everybody. And we are here with Mr. Rocky Romero. Rocky, what's up, my friend? How you doing? Good to be here. Thank you. Uh, first of all, we want to thank you for coming on a holiday, for potting with us on a holiday. Now, just from my Partly my fault, though, because I didn't realize it was a holiday. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. No, we threw it no. out there. This is not, <laughs> okay, okay, this is okay. not on you. <laughs> my bad, my bad. No, we're fine with it. Like, we understand that, like, for some people, like, a holiday is the only time they can do things. Because right. they're True. actually like home and, you know, kind of nothing really to do. I mean, it's the night of Memorial Day. So right. like what's going on? Like everyone's just prepping for jobs that they don't go to tomorrow, you know, <laughs> right. you know, in their living room. But uh, right. <laughs> what I want what I wanted to talk about is now a lot of people would assume because of the uh, the gentleman you hang with and the uh, the group you run with that right now you'd be hammered somewhere at a pool or doing something, but no, you're right. on a podcast with us. So how do you kind of downplay? Out. Yeah. How do you downplay that image? Oh, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know. I just, uh, I mean, you know, as, as much as I would love every day to be vacation and party, unfortunately, I'm way too busy to do that all the time. So, uh, you know, I, if I can get it in once a week, that'd be great. You know, twice a week is like, oh, that's awesome. But, uh, you know, I got a lot of responsibilities with the podcast, with New Japan, with all the other dumb projects that I do on my own with music and other stuff and making content that uh, you can't be hammered a lot, all the time. Yeah, you got a you get laundry stuff list of things yeah. that you do. It's yeah. insane. You brought up the music though. Are you're doing stuff with the music still right now on top yeah. of all of this? Yeah, I uh, I just well, I just finished recording like two songs that I just wrote, and uh, I'm just about to send them over. I was just working on it actually before I hopped on with you guys. I was um, just about to send them over to get them mixed and mastered. And uh, I'm probably gonna put out an EP with a producer I'm working with uh, out of Australia. His name is Glass. And uh, we're probably going to put something out, hopefully by summer, late summer at like August, maybe. That's so, awesome. That's so yeah. exciting. When... I'm working on a Good Brother summer track. They've I, conned I was me ask... into working on a Good Brother summer track. So I'm trying to see if I can write something for that. You know, I was wondering why there hadn't been a Rocky track with all the talking shop stuff going on. That Right. You got Rob Weathers doing everything, but uh, <laughs> we need to get you in there for sure. <laughs> yeah, not quite as good as Rob Weathers, you know, with the writing, but uh, you know, to, <laughs> to to get the essence of what Talking Shop actually is. But um, yeah, no, I'm working on a good a Good Brother summer track. Uh, the the guys at at a Collar and Elbow hit me up and they're like, "Hey, can you do a track for this?" And I was like, "It's a really good idea, but I have no ideas for it. But I will try. So we'll yeah. see. I might need to get Gallows in on it. That's what I think the key is going to be." Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can ping anyone on the Patreon too. I think true. I think they'll spit true. out some good stuff too. Yeah, shout out to the Patreon. <laughs> Is Love there that. any temptation when you do stuff like that? Like, okay, so you have a certain level level of notoriety. You're working with you know some producers, and as you get bigger, like maybe some of the offers from bigger people come along. So do you kind of hold on to stuff and wait and go? Well, you know, I know these people now, but. You know, when the podcast relaunches and something else big happens, I might know even more people. No, no, because I feel like if you like for me, if I hold on to it, either it, it won't happen. I mean, it's rare that I'll go back to a project, you know, and like once I've already started, like I'd, I'd like to get it done. And it usually takes with all the other stuff. It's just hard enough just to get it done. So like I really like once I start something, I, I'd like to get it finished as soon as possible, unless there's just like you know, like no creative spark to keep it going. Uh, then otherwise I might put it on the back burner, maybe come back to it later, but I try to get everything like finished and, and done to, and just put out and, you know, whether it works or not, and, you know, I'm, I have failures all the time, like with all my projects all the time. Yeah. I think like, this is going to be awesome. This is going to go viral. This is going to be like a thing. And then nothing happens. I mean, it's just the way it is, you know, uh, then the stuff that you don't think is going to be super, popular like a talking shop of mania then it blows up you know so um yeah i don't know it's just i feel like nowadays it, it you know it's it's the amount of content you can put out uh not only ne like it's it doesn't really matter necessarily how quality it is because you just don't know what's going to happen at that moment and what it's just what's going on in the world what's hot like something just might spark and something might hit and and you just got to go with it yeah i was gonna say chris knows this 
all too well doing stuff for his thinking on your personal IG and all that stuff where like a TikTok or Instagram reel that you put all this time into creating and you're like, oh, this is going to be great. And it goes nowhere. And yeah. then a quick 15 second video you record like randomly outside just on the just real quick goes yeah. viral selfie style and nothing into it and they're like what is why does this have so many hits yeah yeah nothing <laughs> I, makes sense <laughs> i've done one no. where i've taken hours doing it and then i did one where i was literally walking outside my front door and i could hear my neighbors leaving too so I waited so I wouldn't bump into them. So I didn't have to talk to them. <laughs> and then I like put the camera in my face. I was like, does anybody else just wait till their like neighbor leaves? And it got like 20,000 views and like a hundred comments. They're like, yeah. Like I look outside the window and wait. And then I, I realized, wow, we are some anti-social motherfuckers. Yeah, <laughs> we are not, yeah. don't even want I've to talk that. to anybody. I, it, it got like a hundred times worse with the pandemic. Like I didn't want to be around anybody. So I was like, uh, I'm going to wait till like the whole block leaves and then I'll come out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, I had the experience this weekend at a show um, singing in my band that like people just don't know how to act in public right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't know if when like yeah. people come back to these uh, shows, like when, when live shows start coming back, well, now we just had what a uh, double or nothing with live uh, right. audience, just how people are, are adapting back to it. it. It feels tough for everyone. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't really know. Like, what are the social, like, what are the new social, like, cues that we're supposed to go with? You know, are like, are we supposed to still trying to keep, you know, a certain amount of distance, you know, even whether you're masked, you're not masked, whatever. I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, like, I don't want to be up on anybody. Like, I'm, I'm kind of over all those days of, of, of being packed into something and being like, you know, and like a nightclub or something and lounge or something. And it's just like toe to toe people. And it's like, who wants to do that anymore? Like, I feel like we should try to get away from it. Let's start putting caps on this stuff, you know? Let's yeah. have a good time. Yeah, I'm liking the idea of the, like, pods. Least. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I like the pod idea. The concert, like, pods yeah. where you, like, mm -hmm. buy your tickets and, like, sections and get your own special area. Like, that seems right. super cool. I'm down for that, like, forever. I, yeah, I can't like wait till someone vomits in a pod. <laughs> oh. But they're your own people. So yeah. like, oh, that's great. Yeah, I want to be captured with the dude that can't hold his booze who's vomiting in my pod. Hey, if that's I can't the wait. That you're inviting. This is going to be the best Hall Notes concert ever. I can't wait until everybody vomits all over the screens. Good point. Good point. I mean, that's going to happen to everybody at some point, right? It doesn't matter, you know. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I like I do like the pot idea. I think I think it's okay. Like charge us like a little bit extra so that you don't have to have so many people packed into the place. And then you you know, you feel like you're having your own party, your own atmosphere, your own kind of thing with among your own people, among a sea of people, but obviously it's not like just craziness and people in, you know, rubbing up on each other and stuff like that. I hate that. Yeah. For Forget about live events. People don't know how to act in CVS. I was in CVS today and sure. we, I'm in Jersey and they just, they just like eliminated the uh, mask mandate. Okay. But some people are still wearing them. So right. like I had them on, my kids had them on, but then I walk in and I see like three people walking without them. And I'm like, well, I don't want to look like a pussy. And I like pulled mine down and my kids are like, what are you doing? And then like, they had theirs up and I'm like, no, you leave yours up. Mine's down. I got vaccinated. Like, I'm a man. I don't know what to do anymore. Like, I don't know what I just like. Yeah, like I'm gonna leave it half on, just a <laughs> beard, like a beard cover. I don't, I don't even know yeah. what to do. It's I'm okay with it. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay with masks. I mean, like I kind of think they're a good idea either way. I mean, think about like how close you are sometimes in proximity with people just for like colds and stuff. Like I don't want to get a cold. I don't want to mm. get like like especially traveling and stuff. Like now we've done it for years in Japan. You know, in Japan, I, you know if if it's like flu season or something, you, you know, people wear masks all the time and you're going on the subway or whatever. Like now I feel like it's, it's okay to be introduced into like Western culture as, as a thing to try to protect yourself and protect your others, you know, with spreading germs, which is, I think is fine. You know, I think like now that we, we understand, I don't, you know, I don't think there's a big, like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to get into the big political part of it, but I feel like it's okay. I mean, like, why, why wouldn't we, you know, like if I have a cold and I have to go, get on the train like mm -hmm. i should wear a mask like like that's that'd be like nice you know right. so other people don't so i don't spread my germs and like you know there should be hand sanitizer everywhere always yeah you know? yeah that should have been a thing but my only concern is like now with if masks do become like 
acceptable and kind of people wear them. Like it would encourage people who are really sick, like cold sick to, mm. all right, I'm going to go to work today. Cause I'm going to have a mask right. on anyway. It's like, no, just stay home. Yeah. Like don't yeah. like, you're still going to get everything all over the place. Like don't right. push yourself. Just like, you know, kick back. Don't, don't do anything. Maybe, it's, maybe it gets better that people don't go to work as much, but with the masks, you're kind of like, well, I should, or right, send kids right. to school and things like that. I mean, this thing is old, has been crazy in, in general, just in the, the, like, we've proven that we can get, a, you know, work done at home. Like companies are saving so much money, like especially smaller companies where mm -hmm. they don't have to have an office or an office as big as they have, you know, to house, you know, whatever, 20 people, 30 people, whatever. And then now they can all be at home and they can just have a smaller space, you know, mm -hmm. which, which I think is smart and good for the economy in general, you know? Yeah, our company is going through a whole like work life integration plan to figure out how we're going to go back to the office and what the future is going to look like because it's definitely not going to be the same. There right. is that flexibility worked into it now. Well, Rocky, one of your jobs you can't do from home. <laughs> you yeah. actually the main you, one I can't do from home unfortunately. <laughs> I'm trying to I've been trying to figure out a way to do it for this whole Yeah. How can this we make that happen? Now. I cleared out my living room. I got a, I got a ring in here. We're going to have a whole show here. There's a bathroom. We're exactly. Good. Exactly. Like, you know, like those mocap machines, like I figure if they could just send us all a mocap machine, you know, we can just set it up in our homes and then they can just like take our skeletons and make like mm -hmm. some cool 3d model of us. And then let us just go out there and go nuts. You know, it'd be like, it'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah holograms wrestling each other yes, yes. <laughs> they made those work tupac, yeah tupac rocky romero looking thing yeah <laughs> <laughs> so Would what you... is the latest uh with new japan and travel because japan's kind of what just coming out of their yeah i think they're gonna come out of another state of emergency emergency uh sometime in june like early june like the first week of june or something like that so um they uh, they just announced the Dominion show and card uh, that'll happen on Monday in Osaka, but um, yeah, Osaka and Tokyo are still a little rough right now with COVID cases going up, not enough vaccine, it mm -hmm. seems like, and uh, so yeah, I don't know what's what's going to happen in the long term. Hopefully, they can get some vaccine and start getting it to people, so at least start to lower the numbers. Um, but uh, yeah, not able to get uh, visas for new folks so that's why there's kind of a limited roster uh in new japan this year is just because they haven't been able to process visas since maybe last november or something like that i was able to get one right before i went over and um so i don't know what's gonna happen yeah so hopefully I, you would think with the olympics that they would start opening the doors a little bit more because they're gonna have to process entertainment visas and they're gonna have to process mm -hmm. like athletes visas but uh nothing that i've heard of yet uh, for, for our company just yet. So hopefully soon. So when you go over to Japan, like without pandemic aside, all that things, you, you, it's a different type of atmosphere, especially backstage at a wrestling event. There's like different protocols and rules and you learn about them eventually. How does it change now with a pandemic? Like now does somebody like keep you up to speed? Like now you really don't know, go near people. Now you really right. don't, you know? Uh, yeah. I mean, um, we, you know, the, the usual, you know, meet and greets and stuff like that are, have been completely eliminated. They're only doing them like virtually online. Um, I think like once every couple of weeks or once a month or something. Um, so yeah, so I mean, that, that kind of completely changes the game. Uh, and then obviously the, the crowd has been, you know, dispersed, you know, like they're, they're you know, they're either in pods or they're like every two or three seats or whatever it is. So that's still going on. Uh, they have a cap on the audience. Um, there's certain rules too that that you know they were big on like no spitting, no. Um, they were really worried about you know if, if anybody was bleeding then you know you should really protect yourself or stop the match. Um, you know we haven't had any issues really with that. Um, what else? They didn't want any fighting in the crowd, which is kind of a New Japan staple, especially if you're a bad guy. You know mm -hmm. they would fight all over the buildings in Corkin and all that, so that's been completely eliminated. Um, so yeah, I mean it, it's completely changed the game. Yeah, uh, in a lot of aspects. Did you see last night that uh, Kyrie Irving got a water bottle thrown at him after the game? I, that's like been a trend this last week, right? With, with the popcorn basketball players. Yeah. 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 Did you, yeah, did you notice? 
Yeah. Did you notice that sporting events are becoming like wrestling events and wrestling events are being more like civilized? Like nobody really <laughs> yeah. gets stuff thrown at them anymore. And now when you're at a basketball right. game, like people are chucking shit all over the place. Like how'd that happen? What is going on? Yeah. Like, like, especially basketball players of all, like, like, they're so a they're so close to everybody already right and they and they're just trying to do their thing and there's like i i can't imagine and and what are they doing that really pisses you off that much that you're gonna throw something because somebody didn't make a shot or they messed up a play i mean mm -hmm. like you're just doing your best you're you know like you're a professional athlete you have so much pressure on you the world is crazy right now you're you know you're just trying to like everybody else you're trying to win you know it's like, like yeah. why would you throw something at a professional athlete who's just doing their job you know the best that they possibly can the big thing that people always say is uh i paid this much money so i'm allowed to express myself that doesn't mean you could throw anything but like when they curse at people right. they even said that like the things people say are getting ridiculous i okay. mean yeah i do you often see that you don't really see that at events do you I mean, I feel like I'm a wrestler. I have pretty thick skin, so I'm kind of used to it. You know, our job, you know, is, you know, entails, you know, trying to incite people to, to have some kind of reaction. So um, I guess for me, it's not a big deal, you know, hmm. but, but for maybe for an NBA player, baseball player who that's not their job, their job is to play the game. They're not to involve the crowd uh, is probably very different. And especially in a high pressured situation like that with millions and millions of dollars on the line, sometimes, you know, a billion dollars, whatever, you know, depending on, on how big the circumstances are. So, uh, you know, for whether wrestling is like, we want you to, the more you can scream and yell at me, like we, now we have a moment, you know, so, mm. um, very different. I feel like, yeah. Yeah. So rock, what's it, it's been what, 21 years for you at this point in the business or somewhere around there? Why would you say that? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you remind me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Always yeah. like a woman. You oh, can't okay. ask them age, but as soon as they want to talk <laughs> age with you, they're like, what's it been? Like 23 hours, 14 yeah. or 23 years, 14 that would minutes, make 13 you seconds? 77, right? You're like, no. what's uh, <laughs> now? Um, yeah, about I, 21 years, I would say. Yeah. What I did learn is that from the beginning, you wanted to go to Japan. Yeah. Like that was yeah. always the game plan for you. What was it about Japan that you wanted to jump right to there? Cause that's not usually the step the that path. people are taking, yeah. especially here in the U S. Um, you know, I, I think it, like I saw the first, I want to say I saw this, this saw the first J cup and it kind of just blew my mind that there was like this, you know, packed Ryugoku Sumo hall with like whatever, 10, 12,000 people. And everybody's like, just watching what the people are doing there and like getting popcorn and like doing it like like all eyes are locked in on this ring and these two you know it was like Weiger and like Eddie Guerrero Black Tiger or something like that and and uh just like you know they go to do something with two seconds they put they stand up and then there's just like like a golf clap applause like it was just so different that and you could see like obviously they respected like what these guys were doing like these guys putting their lives on the line. They're like trying their hardest. They're in on it and everybody's locked in on it as opposed to um, kind of like sometimes, like you said uh, earlier, when, you know, I paid this money so I can do whatever I want. And, it, and it, I just, I don't know, I, there was something about that and, and wrestling and how I kind of felt the same way as like, I guess the, the Japanese fans did. Like I really respected what the two guys or, or, or two women were doing in the ring, you know? So I feel like, uh, I don't know. I just wanted to be a part of that. And then I started to read a little bit. I read like Dan, my kid's book, and he kind of put it in perspective of like how much, you know, Japanese wrestling and how important it is to the culture and like how well they treated them. And, and I was just like, why? Like, and then I saw guys like Guerrero and Jericho, uh, you know, they travel over there and then they became bigger stars. They were able to move to, you know, WCW and all this stuff. So I figured just like, that's probably the the route that I would go. You know, these guys are, you know, I'm closer to those guys kind of size than like a Hulk Hogan or something, you know, or, or uh, somebody else in WWF at that time. So I just figured that's that's what I should do. And 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 once that was the goal, I just kind of never looked back. And then I got there, I did my first tour, and I was like, this is awesome. This is everything that I've ever wanted to do. And uh, I, I just I would like to make a career here and just stay here if that's possible. You know, not knowing that they were going to break into the U S and all that later, you know? Yeah. Right. 
was it hard working like when you go over to a different country and you're working primarily as a heel you grew up watching wrestling but you also you know what's going to piss people off because you live in this country but when you go over there you're in a completely different country so you're kind of thinking to yourself what's going to piss these people off like it's, there's probably like a disconnect there because it's just not right. the same. So how, how long did it take you to figure out, okay, this is what really gets them going? You know, it was much harder in the beginning because I felt like the, the Japanese fans were so used to just being like extremely respectful that they didn't want to boo you for a while there. Like, like when I started, they didn't want to boo people because maybe they, they didn't want to show that disrespect, like, you know, so like there was like a, a weird cultural thing going on with the wrestling fans. Then like later, uh, you know, I mean, the, it like it like from the eighties, it used to be like that. Then I think in like the nineties, it went to like super respect, re, super respectful. And then like, obviously like two thousands ish, it started to change against once new Japan started to really mess with like the old school babyface heel dynamic that uh, people started to boo again and they were like, oh, it's okay to boo the heels and like feel and be okay with and be upset, you know? Because like, like you, you, it's crazy. Like the amount of heat that they actually get obviously in the arena, but like the actual heat that they get outside where like they're emailing, sending like typed up letters, handwritten letters to like the offices being like, the Bullet Club is cheating way too much and we're not happy with it. We're New Japan pro wrestling fans and blah, blah, blah. Like I've been watching this and that, you know, like, and they send like real letters and like real, like, uh, and they complain for real. Like, <laughs> like it's really interesting. So like it, it, it's working, but on a whole nother level. Cause like, especially to Japanese fan, I, I feel like they think that it's, uh, it's more realistic that, than, than it is in the States. Obviously, you know, it's, it's not just an act, you know, um, they, they, they don't want to know like if me and, Jay White got a beer. They don't. They don't want to know about it. They don't want to see it. It right. bothers them, you know. And they, and they complain to the office like, "Why is Rocky with Jay White? <laughs> you know, why are they, why are, why do we see them having a beer? They're, that like they're in two different factions. That should never happen, you know. Like, I I complain about that stuff. How often do I complain about that? About which? Like, one of my biggest gripes is, and I understand they're a global billion dollar company. But when I'm watching a segment where I'm supposed to hate Roman Reigns guts mm -hmm. and then they cut to commercial and he's doing something for like boys and girls club of America, right. how am I supposed to boo that dude? If right. he's doing something nice in the next segment, I mean, they've gotten a little better at it, but before it was kind of like that stuff like that more than anything takes me out of it. Right. So Chris right. is the one writing the letter. Screw the boys and girls club. <laughs> <laughs> I need a real heat magnet. <laughs> but, uh, but getting back to your point about like writing the letters and like not booing you uh, on a bunch of different podcasts that I've listened to, I think like Orrin Anderson has said it a couple of times. Jim Ross has said it a couple of times. Uh, when you light the crowd, they're less inclined to like boo or cheer or do anything like animated because they feel like they're being watched. Right. But as soon right. as you darken them, they're louder, they'll boo, they'll yell shit. So do you think it's that like the Japanese crowd doesn't want to be seen booing and yelling around other people, but they could be keyboard warriors when they're home and write an angry email and say what they don't like seeing? Yeah, I think it's more of a, yeah. And, and but I, I think it's like, yeah, I think Jim Ross is completely right about that. And I, I think it's the same thing in Japan. Like, obviously, when it's more lit in, in you know, depending on the arena where it, like, if it's more lit, then they're less likely to, uh, you know, go all out, you know, as yeah. opposed, you know, but um, I also think it's just a cultural thing in general. Like, in Japan, nobody really wants to be singled out as that individual either, you know, like generally, I feel like, you know, mm -hmm. so um, when somebody's, you know, I, I, that's just a cultural thing, you know, uh, there's just like, uh, you know, I respect you, respect me. I don't want to make a big deal about it. Like, I don't want to make a big thing about it. I don't want all the spotlight on me. Like, like there, you'll see a lot of people who post uh, online, but like, they'll take a picture like with Naito or something, but Nido will be there, but they'll fit, they'll they'll like blur out their face when they post it on Instagram. But they're still proud of it and to be with them. They just don't want to be, they just don't want to be singled out. They don't want to have the attention on them. I would automatically assume it was porn. <laughs> <laughs> if it was blurred out, as I'd be like, what's well they, what's going well on over the other side of the picture? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> now, is it 
that way for um, the Japanese wrestlers too that are from there. Like when they come and wrestle here, mm -hmm. is it strange for them to have that different audience that you're aware of? I guess. Um, I think that they enjoy it. Yeah, you know, I think that they enjoy it because um, it, it, it is a different level. It's like, like even like how how crazy the U.S. fans can be. Like uh, you know, wrestling in Mexico for a bunch of years like Mexican fans are even, even like more intense, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I feel like that, that would probably be like Japan is the most calm than maybe like UK slash States. Right. And mm -hmm. then maybe like uh, the most intense level would be like Puerto Rico, Mexico or something like that, you know? So I feel like, uh, like, yeah. So I, if I, so me wrestling in Mexico, I probably is equivalent to like the Japanese wrestling in, in the States and being like, whoa, this is wild. Like, but like, cool, you know, <laughs> like yeah. th this is kind of what I, like, I want to experience this. Like, this is pretty interesting, you know? So what's the Japanese fan? Like, do they have uh, fan conventions the way we have fan conventions? where it's a bunch of people yes. up in conference rooms and you're uh, kind of like the, the awkwardness of it like <laughs> right right maybe not so big like like the way that we do conventions like we do conventions on a pretty grand scale i feel like when it comes to wrestling conventions hmm. like WrestleCon and stuff but um they you know i think it's more like it's they they do it on a more like frequent basis i would say so like if you go to a show there's probably like a couple meet up with a couple of friends like or you're going or you or you're like you know what's going on schedule wise you're going to go a little earlier hang out, you know like where the entrances are you're going to hang out you like you're more likely to like interact i think with with some of the wrestlers as as opposed to like wwe where like you know you go in the back way and then it like it's easier i think to meet with like the wrestlers in japan which is kind of cool too so um but convention wise yeah i don't think i don't not that i know of that there's big conventions but literally you can go in tokyo if you live in tokyo or soccer you can go to a wrestling show you know you know every day or sometimes twice a day you know wow you know what i'm saying because like if you go to corican on a saturday and sunday there's usually a like a um a, a matinee show Mm -hmm. at like 12 or one or something or three or something and, or yeah so maybe 12 then that they get out and they have like whatever an hour and a half to get out then the next company comes in within that next hour and a half oh wow and then they're they're on at like 6 30 so so yeah it's usually 12 and then 6 30 i think so 12 or 12 30 and 6 and then 6 30 so on saturday and sunday and then monday through friday there's a match at 6 30 every night so they almost have like a territory approach to think they're almost like yeah. in the territory days pretty much yeah yeah that's crazy yeah I, and what happens like so if there's a venue where there's two different companies coming in like do they ever host like joint events or do like guys hang no. out with the next one they they don't even like interact with each other no i mean there might be like a couple of people like if you have a couple of friends in the other company you might like you might pass in and be like hey but i mean no not really I I can't imagine any situation where like AEW is running the one o'clock show and WWE is coming in for the six o'clock show and mm -hmm. they like clear out like in the state, like that would never happen in a billion years around here. Yeah, but that's how they've done it forever in Japan. I feel like it's, it's always been like that. Like there's so many times where um, like Noah will be on at 1230 or whatever, 12. And then we're always, we're always on it at the 630 at night. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, some some of everybody will be like, oh, I, I I'm gonna go sneak into the Noah show and like watch a little bit because I'm gonna go see like Mar Fuji or something, mm -hmm. and then you know I hear like, oh yeah, I went to it was pretty cool, but but like you go there too and like the companies are not on the best terms, you know, so like you don't want to be like also the guy who like shows up and then like you get mobbed and then everybody's taking pictures of you or like somebody puts you on camera or something, you know, so like you don't want that either. So like if you can go kind of sneak upstairs. Or somewhere in the building and like kind of watch below say hello to your people and then kind of like stay a little bit but then get out you know mm -hmm. that, that's always good yeah that was going to be my question if they kind of had the same dynamic of companies here or at this point just just one and the rest yeah. of them because everyone is everyone else is uh, working together now it's right awesome to see but that's interesting they're kind of the same way with that yeah yeah but like yeah you like so they like somebody did that with uh with somebody a couple of years ago with WWE, right? Where they put them on camera or something at like, 
I don't know, some independent show or something. And then everybody was like, and then I think they got in trouble with WWE. I don't know, I remember there was some kind of, yeah, but you don't want that. That That's does sound kind of familiar. I yeah. feel like there was also, I don't know if there was like well-known shit, but I feel like there might've been some repercussions with Adam Cole and Britt. Like at, right. I think when they, they were like at parties. Yeah. yeah. Uh, After Brody passed and like, okay, they're going to uh, add, you know, like you got to leave them alone. Like this is a kind of thing, but like when they're on camera together and like, okay, we know, like people know, mm -hmm. like they got to go live their life. But I feel like that is going to be kind of frowned upon just because it's whatever. Right. Right. The enemy or whatever, however they look at it. But getting back to you. So when you, when you go over to Japan, um, when you first start working, you're under the hood, right? As black tiger. Is that uh, immediately? I, well, no, no. I debut in 2002 uh, from the original LA dojo. So me, Brian Danielson, Ricky Reyes, TJP, and a guy named Jack Bull. Then we go over in 2002, we, we debut. And then, and then I don't go back for like two years, almost a year and a half or something. I go like, they send me like on an excursion to Mexico. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then when I come back in 2004, I do a super junior. And then after that, they, they say, okay, Hey, can, do you want to become black tiger? And I was like, me, are you sure? So, so how do they decide, do they decide that because of a working style? Do they decide that because you've been gone for a while? How does that happen? I think that they, they like me. They didn't know what to do with me. Right. And then this was the time of, they had just signed Tiger Mask and they were going to make him like the centerpiece of the junior division. And I think, you know, he, and he's a big fan, you know, he's a, he's a, a, a student of the original Tiger Mask. So he wanted to do kind of like a similar situation where we're like you know he want you know he didn't have a dynamite kid but he wanted uh you know like a black tiger you know so um i think it might have been him that maybe suggested it possibly i think he might have been like oh what about rocky Mary would be great you know he's young you can do this blah, blah. and uh and then they asked me and i was still confused like what <laughs> you want me to do that you know like really good wrestlers do that like eddie Guerrero, silver king mark rocco like really really accomplished wrestlers you like want me and they're like yeah and I was like okay so then I, I I tried to take it as seriously as possible and I you know I wanted it to be as close to the original because I I figured that's what what he you know Tiger Mask was thinking so uh they came up with the the idea that I was going to be a student of the original Black Tiger and then so like I started talking with like a weird British accent a terrible British accent you know, because nobody knew it was me, right? So, uh, and then I started to um, to just wrestle exactly like Mark Rocco did. Like I studied all, like hours and hours of tape where looking for like those little mannerisms, like the way he would like adjust his hood and like all this stuff and like the way he would walk and then speed up and slow down. And I just tried to like mimic all that. And uh, so, so much that I didn't, I wasn't even Rocky Romero at all for like the first probably eight months. And then I started to incorporate things that I liked and things I needed to do uh, for me. And then, and I kind of made it my own, but in the beginning it was all completely like, like a, a carbon copy of, of Mark Rocco, yeah. Did you watch any like bad British shows to try and get an accent down? <laughs> I probably should have. <laughs> I didn't take the British accent like that. <laughs> I probably should have taken a little off. more. Yeah, a little, yeah. There were, I don't. I don't remember the British Bank Off show. If I would have had now and I had Netflix now, I probably my British accent would have been like top notch. For sure. I know. I'm interested in hearing this British, <laughs> British accent. This is a new character on uh, NS3. <laughs> yeah. He just yelled "blimey" a lot. He's like "blimey," <laughs> bollocks. There's a lot of bollocks. Bollocks. <laughs> Uh, yeah, like I could imagine, because I know uh, I interviewed uh, Jericho a bunch of years ago, and he said when he went over to the Japan, he learned Japanese by watching American movies that he knew and knew mm -hmm. the dialogue for and listened to the Japanese and then figured oh, out wow. the thing. So, I mean, how did you learn that? Yeah, he would watch like 80s movies on like their TNT or whatever on all the time. And right, they knew right, what the right. lines are going to be. And they're like, OK, well, now I know what that's saying. So how did you learn? Um, well, I, I should clarify that I, I don't speak, you don't speak okay. Japanese, but I like, I know enough to get me around in daily life, mm -hmm. like generally, you know, mm -hmm. so like I can order food, I can tell you how many I need from ordering for a group of people. I can do that, you know, mm -hmm. like I can do that, but, um, but I, I can't like, 
conversate in Japanese, <laughs> but I can also understand quite a bit more than I actually realize, you know? Mm. So like when people are conversating, I can pick out details and kind of have a general understanding of what the conversation is about, mm -hmm. but you know, where, where people are like on the sides of the conversation, that's a little more difficult for me. So, um, but um, just, just talking to people and, and, and kind of like, I, like I tried to study, like actually do it. And, you know, I was a terrible student, I'm even worse, like on my own, trying to teach myself how to, you know, do stuff like languages and stuff that's difficult. So, um, so I just kind of like talked to people and like learned words and like Nakamura helped me out a lot. Like he would teach me like some words and things like, like a bunch of the phrases and catchphrases I have, they're all either from Nakamura or Okada. And, uh, you know, so like they've kind of influenced me a lot. And then they do the same thing when Okada's like, oh, I want to put out a tweet in English. He's like, does this sound right? And he'll give me like his version of like, oh, okay, this sounds a little strange, but how about you do this and this? And he's like, oh, okay, great. And then he'll put it out, you know? So, um, uh, so yeah, that's kind of like, like how just kind of conversating and talking to people and asking questions. I always like, I'm kind of fascinated by the Japanese culture in general, like I always have been. So it's easy to ask questions and kind of like remember things from there, you know? There's no way I'd be able to do that. I, there, <laughs> I, could, I could not, I would, I would be completely clueless out there yeah. with anything. And, and you are in the beginning, but just like anything, the more familiar, the more time you spend there the more you you kind of understand. Like everybody in some kind of way understands, you know, some basic words. You just you just can't get away from it, you know? Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I'm gonna assume either Nakamura, somebody screwed with you and told you to say something that wasn't correct. Like, you know, they kind of ribbed you and they were like, yeah, well, <laughs> so, so what What do they actually tell Probably you? All you, know, you I'm sure you don't English. remember the Japanese, but what did they tell you that ended up being in English? <laughs> <laughs> uh i mean i don't know i can't, like I can't ball smell I like cinnamon or something yeah like yeah there i don't even think i should say it <laughs> but like i remember being there like the first like year and and going to um like to dinner after like sponsors and then you know shinsuke being like i'm uh, like oh shinsuke how do i say like this, this, this and he'd be like oh like this and then he like tells me and then i like say it to that and then everybody just breaks out in laughter <laughs> you're like i guess and i'm like it <laughs> am i cute right now do you guys think i'm being cute or like, <laughs> like what's going on did here? i say it wrong did, or I say it did wrong? you tell me something that i shouldn't have said right right and then like red shoes on would be like rocky you can't say that you can't say that this is japan i'm like what <laughs> 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 and did he fess up that it was him uh yeah no everybody had a laugh about it, it oh, okay all yeah it was all good. Yeah. Good. it was all just, one big rib just checking me. yeah ribbon on the square so uh, how did you make the transition over to Ring of Honor? Uh, so yeah, ROH was kind of, so I think once I, I debuted in Japan, I think ROH came around like 2004 or something, I want to mm -hmm. say 2003, 2004. And uh, so they, they had just relaunched the company and, and that's when Kerry Silken had taken over. And then they brought in like all kinds of new talent, uh, like Delirious and I think Alex Shelley and like everybody like, uh, Tyler Black, everybody. So um, I was just kind of a part of that that squad. So I started with them, and then I ended up signing like a a contract with them, but it it wasn't uh, exclusive or anything. And then so I was able to do Japan and still go other places. And then I just kind of like always had a connection to Ring of Honor because basically it always been like, well, when you're not doing Japan, you know, come work for us whenever you can. So I just kind of did that for years and years and years. And then that was kind of how the ROH New Japan relationship just kind of worked hand in hand because New Japan didn't have a partner in the US at that time. And Ring of Honor was starting to really grow. And, you know, the Bucks had just signed with Ring of Honor and it just kind of all made sense. You know, we were already using the Bucks a bunch. So, uh, so uh, I went and met Tiger Hattori in New York and we had, an, uh, we had a, uh, a meeting with uh, Delirious and Kevin Kelly at the time because Kevin Kelly was working there. And, uh, and then we just kind of put the partnership together and then kind of helped each other, you know, and went all the way to, you know, MSG and I don't know, the rest is history. I feel like, yeah. yeah. I was at that show. <laughs> yeah. It was an incredible show. It was wonderful. Yeah. yeah. That was my first, uh, new Jan new Japan experience actually seeing them live. So that was, it was such yeah. a cool thing to be a it part was, of. It was crazy. It was crazy yeah. to be wrestling in MSG and 
seeing Okada and Jay in the main event and like Ibushi and Naito, it's like, what is going on right now? This is insane. And yeah. The crowd was insane. Yeah, it was unreal. Unreal. Every new, like all the new Japan guys were like mega stars. I felt like even I got a huge pop and I was like, the music hit and I was like, what is going on? Like, <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Like, what I'm just a job. Here? I'm just a jobber in New Japan, you know. Like, hey. <laughs> now, did that set up um, New Japan Strong? Was it that show that kind of set the tone for that and what that was going to become, or was that already in the works? So, kind of New, New Japan Strong wasn't in the works like anytime soon. I feel like uh, you know, it, it, it was the idea. It was like a five year plan of you know creating a dojo creating new uh you know trainees and young lions and wrestlers and kind of building like slowly you know and to like a something like a new japan strong where we you know have our own uh you know kind of separate um uh division and in, in w- between two companies right or a separate brand or whatever so um that was gonna take a while I, I, you know and, and traditionally it was you know because we you know there's always going to be japan which is the bread and butter and you know there's a, a x amount of tours a year so not everybody either can be on it or like there's going to be people who are going to be really busy you know so um when the pandemic happened it was like well what do we do we we you know we have to continue to you know try to a develop our wrestlers who are just sitting at home some of them can't even travel to japan so what are we doing and uh, but we can't run shows in front of a live audience so then it it just made sense like, well, why don't we create a brand uh, that's that's completely, you know, con- A, and content for, for New Japan World, you know, people are paying 10 bucks a month. So like, um, so then it, it was like, why don't we just do it without fans? And we'll, you know, we'll create like a studio style TV show with, but it's New Japan style. Like it's, it's about hard hitting matches. You know, there's not like a lot, like a bunch of like goofiness, you know, nobody's fighting because, you know, some like, they're dragging coffins of somebody's dead mother or something, you know, like none of that shit. Like, let's just like, keep it old school, keep it simple, you know, crack up promotions. Uh, you know, there's gotta be, you know, people want to win, people want to win money, people want to win championships, let's just, you know, strip it down. And then, and that's kind of how New Japan Strong was, was created. And um, I feel like the first maybe like eight months what was difficult because it, it was such a new concept for Japanese fans. And then American wrestling fans, because it wasn't the traditional New Japan way uh, of doing things. But uh, I, I think we've really hit our stride. And now that our wrestlers are, are more, they're familiar with a lot of the new wrestlers like Tom Lawler and, you know, Dickinson and all these guys. And um, now I think it's like really hitting a stride. And it's a pretty dope show, I think. I think it's fun to watch and easy to digest. And it's, you know, usually less than an hour. Mm-hmm. Um, so you don't have to like, it's not a major commitment, which is hard about wrestling right now, because now you have to commit like seven hours a week of to watch wrestling <laughs> there's impossible. so much yeah, yeah, so, yeah so covid was good for something it accelerated right. <laughs> these yeah, five-year plans into something else right, uh, right. but it's great to hear it's going well um who would you say like our top two or three to look out for that are wrestling is strong right now fred rosser i think he's my favorite i think he's uh so underrated in so many ways and and it's it's crazy to me that he didn't get to do more in wwe i think he's really really talented he has a great message he's a great person like he's you know he's he's the type of guy who's you know out there you know speaking to kids about bullying and like put his money where his mouth is you know so i i think overall he's just a great pickup for for new japan in general and uh he's somebody to watch in the ring he's been really kicking ass uh i think Tom Lawler is amazing. I think like he he's in, like funny. He's uh he's the real deal. He's a fantastic wrestler. Uh, he's a great talker. I think like he's got all you know. I, there's a reason why he's the champion. I feel like, and um and then I like in general just our all our LA Dojo guys, Carl Fredericks, uh, Clark Connors, Alec Coughlin, uh, DKC, Kevin Knight. All those guys are gonna be mega stars. Now, did they come from any other indie promotions or just straight into the dojo? Yeah, they all have different kind of levels of uh, of experience. But yeah, they usually, yeah, they all started somewhere else. And then either through tryouts or through, um, yeah, I think mostly the tryouts or camps, Shibata found them in some kind of way. 
and and you know was like oh i want you know i want these guys to be my students and they all said yeah and now they're kicking ass yeah Yeah. how do you get um like when you have a show like that and sometimes when these shows make it to american television uh american tv executives try to like tend to uh, americanize it up and like mess with things or like want to give their notes even though they have zero wrestling background or knowledge Mm -hmm. so how do you kind of work around like too many cooks in the kitchen trying to mess stuff you know we haven't had that problem yet uh but i feel like eventually it's going to happen 100 but i i I almost have to be like it'll happen yeah once you get successful everybody wants their fingers in the pie and that's exactly and and i feel like the, the best way to tell them is like you know wwe is one thing right we 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 all don't want to be clones of wwe because there's like there can only be one wwe and and it's going to be a very you know shitty watered down version of we're trying to do that because you know we're not built off of that you know we've been in business for you know since 1972 doing it this way but like i agree let's present it in and how it looks to into a way for the western audience or somebody to to accept it and understand it but um but let's keep all the elements that make it cool let's just keep doing that you know, and I feel like that's probably the best way to, to, uh, to get that over, you know, kind of get them to understand, hopefully, you know, because I don't like, look at the WWE product. It's making more money than it, it ever has, but you know, the numbers are down like crazy, you know, cause people aren't watching it. Cause like the product is not very good, yeah, <laughs> you know, we've like, had, to say the least. You know, no, so. we've, we've had that discussion a few times that like, yeah wrestling's great like the wrestlers are are great but in terms of the storylines and everything else that they're doing it's just it's not captivating it's not grabbing anyone's attention it's funny i'm sorry i I was gonna say i i just had this conversation so i have two kids they're 11 and 8 and they recently got into wrestling and they started their gateway it was wwe with just different things going on they haven't watched in like a month or two and my daughter was like I want to watch SmackDown tonight. And I was like, mm-hmm. hey, she goes, we haven't watched in a couple months. Are we going to know what's going on? And I was like, yeah, you'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Within the first five minutes. You're- right. <laughs> right. And it's just See, like, like, yeah. And like society has changed a lot, right? Like we're used to like Netflix, you know, long, you know, like storytelling series, you know, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Like a lot of us have really come to enjoy that. So like, you kind of have to have a mixture of both you also need to be able to pick up at any time like if the kids say like we haven't watched in months and like like your situation and then you pick up and like you kind of you got to understand what's going on it can't be like you know you're season three of, of breaking bad and you're like what is going on wait who's walter white you know so mm-hmm. but there's got to be a good mixture of that i feel like um like I, I, that's why i do think new japan is so simple and it's formula that it doesn't matter where you pick up, you can easily understand, oh, like, oh, these two are fighting. Okay, cool. Oh, this guy's the champion. So who's the challenger? Oh, he's always on the other side in some kind of way, right? So, okay, there's the, you know, there's the challenger. So like, it's not too difficult because really the only thing that matters is being the champion. It's the Mm -hmm. only thing that matters. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you about that because so we were going through and we were doing some research. And at one point you were the longest reigning ring of honor tag team champion. That eventually got, you know, eclipsed. I was. (laughs) <laughs> you I didn't know that. Yeah, you were. Uh, oh, boy, you were. Surprise. Surprise. <laughs> we got you trophy. <laughs> You're not in anymore, but we got you trophy. Damn so it. my question was to that point, like before it used to be when you became the champion and got a title, that was the big deal. But that changes hands so many times now. Mm. Does the longevity of holding a championship, like like Nick Aldis has been NWA champion for like going on three years now, three and a half years. Is that what guys kind of work towards? Like, I want to hold this belt for as long as possible. I think, yeah, you know, the hot potatoing of a belt, although, you know, it, it does happen and it could show like how competitive, you know, a division might be. But I think overall, someone holding a championship for a long time, making defenses that mean something mm-hmm. in the long run is always going to be a more interesting story. Look at like The Undertaker and the Streak, for mm-hmm. example you know, and like how much controversy that created each year, how, you know, when, when he finally did lose, what a big deal that was and what a moment it was like, everybody can tell you that where they were, what they were doing when the undertaker lost, 
everybody get, you know, who, who watches wrestling religiously or at least watches WrestleMania. Um, so I feel like that is the great example. Like maybe that's a little bit, you know, 20 something years or whatever, 19 years or whatever it was might be a little too much, but like, uh, you know, for somebody to be a champion, but I feel like, yeah, a year, you know, something, you know, and like the Okada run, I think was the perfect example of that. Like Okada had that like year and a half run or whatever it was, where he made like, he was just like incredible match, incredible match, incredible match, Kenny, Kenny, then blah, blah, blah. Then finally Kenny beats him for it in that, you know, hour and a half long match or whatever it was. And it's like a big deal, you know? So uh, I think that's a great example of like modern uh, storytelling, you know, at, from, you know, at, from a champion's perspective, you know? Mm -hmm. Yep. Big fan of long-term storytelling over here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it's important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, kind of speaking of full circle for you on your AEW Dark Elevation debut, uh, that Rapongi Vice reunion at the end got a lot of people popping and talking on Twitter. So right. how was how was that little reunion with? It was awesome. It was awesome. Um, you know. I, I, I want to do more. I wish we, we can do more with, with Trent or at least with uh, the whole best friends as a group. I mean, I'd love to work, work with Orange Cassidy in some kind of way. I've never done that. So that'd be really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, I think it just kind of shows also like the New Japan and AEW dynamic and where the relationship is and where it possibly might be going. You know, obviously it, it's a relationship that, that uh, is complicated, you know, over so many years it was, it was, extremely complicated when you know uh the elite left and you know trent left and chuck left at the same time all together so um it was weird you know for a few years but um now with the pandemic and some management changes within new japan that door has kind of been open you know and and we we've seen some really cool collaborations you know uh with kind of moxley and kenta and omega and you know nagata and now we're Pungy Vice, maybe, you know, on a, on a, yeah. on a you know, we, we like, it's always been about Dynamite. So it's kind of cool that it's like Dark Elevation, you know, so that might be something different. Maybe it'll be on Dynamite. Maybe it'll be on something else. You know, I don't know. You know, we'll see Rampage coming up. <laughs> Rampage. Yeah, that's a possibility, you know, and, and especially as they, you know, they're growing and they get new shows and stuff like that, which is awesome. Uh, you know, who knows, you know, maybe. Maybe that's a, you know, we can get more strong talent. You know, Leo was just uh, on last night uh, in the uh, the Battle Royal. So uh, that's pretty cool. He was the Joker, right? Yeah, he, came yeah, on as the Joker. Sick. Yeah, so he's a New Japan strong talent, you know. Uh, another guy to watch, for sure. Yeah. I mean, we'd be remiss if we didn't ask. Last week, there was a rumor floating around about WWE and New Japan. I mean, is it a rumor? I mean, as much as you can speak on it. As much as I can speak of. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that you repeated that. I, think so. <laughs> uh, I mean, what can I say? I mean, you know, like, like th this is the thing. Everybody talks, you know what I'm saying? Like for sure, you know, all the companies talk in some kind of way in some, some kind of form. So how much you want to believe or how much you want to get into it. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I shouldn't say much more than that, but uh, you know, like, it's possible that there could be some truth that's possible that it's all a lie. I really like, <laughs> like, or like, it, you know, like, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I'll make it a little bit easier for you. So you can't kind of, so you don't, you know, please yeah, I'm drown it. <laughs> you, you, you've worked, you, you've worked for new Japan. Yeah. You've worked for ring of honor. Mm -hmm. You've done AEW stuff. You've, you know, you had like dabbled with WWE. You work with two people who were very much entrenched in WWE. Everything you know from all of those organizations and the people close to you, do you think there could ever be a time when every organization works together in some way? Yeah, I think it's possible. I don't see it being a long-term thing because I don't think it's a sustainable thing for some of the companies and the egos and how they work, you know? Um, but... I think, you know, if they could get some of the ego aside, I think that there's some really cool collaborations that everybody could do together. That would be really uh, something just insane and important and, and giving the fans what they want and kind of reheating the business and a whole kind of, you know, like, cause I think that would bring like 
regular folk who who like wrestling but they don't really watch it or like you know maybe they'll stop and watch like five minutes of of a raw or five minutes of an AEW that like that would create like their interest because people wrestling fans would be so excited like you can't believe this that like Seth Rollins is gonna wrestle like Kenny Omega and they're like who's Kenny Omega and they're like whoa this is other company and they're like whoa that sounds interesting you know like yeah i'd watch that you know like and, and see five minutes of it and then see like an insane crowd at, you know at the jaguar stadium and there's like fifty thousand people going nuts i mean like that would probably make the, the business super hot again i feel like so i, I like if they could get an ego aside and, and kind of understand that and maybe there's there's a future in that but i i like i almost think like it, it's not sustainable for long term because people just get like defensive I think of things you know but and, that, and that's kind of the hard part about doing collaborations but I don't know but you hopefully like New Japan AEW Impact you know ROH you know whoever will like set the template of how to do that where everybody kind of wins and more importantly the fans win so yeah. I think that that's the that's kind of like should be the goal right now you know we should all be like trying to understand each other, respect each other's business, respect each other's players in the business. And then like how to like do it all where it makes sense, where it's a give and take and we're like a real working business relationship so that there's so much more that it'll, it'll create, uh, you know, obviously revenue for the companies, create revenue for the wrestlers and then create an amazing product for fans. So I think that's the, that's the real goal for now. And uh, you know, the good thing about that is Right, you know, right now there's not a lot of that ego going on within the companies. They all kind of understand that, you know, and they all have the same goal at this moment. So I think that's good. Yeah, it seems like a really good starting point right now. I know, I mean, us just as fans get excited every time we see someone else show up on another show and see them collaborating together and working like that. It's it's exciting to see, and we only want to see more of yeah, it. So. What sucks is like the fans that are like, um, like I was reading some of the comments, like when they were talking about, uh, cause I got tagged in probably like, a, you gazillion, know better, Rocky. a gazillion <laughs> comments, with the WWE, comments, new Japan stuff. <laughs> and I, like so much, that I was like, I'm like, I gotta troll the fuck out of these people too. So, um, uh, but, I, but like, they were like, um, well, like what Narita, Rocky Romero, Nagata, Kenta, like, are those names like, like if they wanted to make a statement, it should be like, oh God, it's like. And then there, thank God there's some great fans out there that were just like, you think Okada has time right now? Like he's, he's a, like, he just had COVID. He's like doing this. He's like doing that. Like, like, I'm sure these are all the building blocks. You know what I'm saying? Like, these are the building blocks to tell, like, what is the point of bringing Okada over if like, he's only can wrestle in front of, you know, 2000 people, you know, like, what is right. the point of that? Like, why wouldn't you wait until there's like, they can put 60,000 people in a, in a stadium, you know, like, uh, you know, and this is just kind of, and, and really nobody knows. I mean, like, like, like I said, like the AEW New Japan connection uh, and relationship is, was an extremely shaky one from the start, you know, like, you know, there was a lot of, uh, you know, hurt feelings on both sides and, and it wasn't easy. And like to get where we are even now is, has been amazing step after step after step. So I feel like, uh, you know, time will tell. And, and if we can continue to do that on both sides, and I think it's going to be uh, you know, it's going to be worth it. And you're going to see somebody like a Okada or somebody maybe come over in the future. That's very likely, you know, mm -hmm. as long as things progress that way, you know? Yeah. So before, um, before we get into some, we want to talk real quick, some talking shop stuff, but before we get into that, I want to kind of also slightly put you on the spot here, but not really. You'll, you'll see where I'm going. There's a super show. Oh, it's AW. it's ring of honor. It's new Japan. It's impact. It's everybody, but WWE basically. Right. And you have this super car. Yeah. Yes. What city gets to host it? Oh. They got me thinking. Yeah. I feel like for hmm. I gotta guess, but I'm saying I'll I've got my choice. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say last. Yeah. I'm gonna probably say like Chicago. Is that <laughs> that's what I was gonna say? It's got it's gotta be Chicago. I feel like the Chicago is the ones. A, it's easy to get to from both sides of the, the United States, which is important, right? It's a destination. Uh, mm -hmm. It could hold something as crazy as that, like a big show like that, where, where it would mean something, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, the easy ones would be like Vegas too, but 
Mm -hmm. I mean, Jacksonville, they have the infrastructure from AEW, which would be cool. And then for New Japan, I think to, you know, MSG or something like that would always be like important to them, right? At this point. Mm -hmm. And then it would mean a lot to the wrestling fans. And then obviously it would be like a, a big fuck you to, to WWE, right? So, um, yeah, I don't know. I think Chicago would probably make the most sense though. I think that would probably be the one. And then plus like, that's kind of where the AEW idea started. I mean, there's a, you know, Okada was involved. New Japan was involved in that show, you know, I know Tony Khan came there, right? Saw the thing. So plus you need, yeah, you need the two straight months of punk's going to be there. Punk's going to wrestle. <laughs> as well. He's going to be there. And like, as well. Right. That whole thing, like if Punk could live off of, he's gonna be there his entire <laughs> life. Like he's got shows on it, he's gonna be there. He's like <laughs> literally anything that happens in Chicago is like Punk's gonna be there. <laughs> New Jersey guy here, like bars sell out because they think Springsteen's coming. Like Punk, <laughs> like, just show a picture where he's outside the venue and the place right. will sell out, and he could do that for the next ten years. <laughs> but like, so just the Punk's gonna be there. It's gonna help. Don't get me wrong, like I love him, but like right. I know that they're gonna live with that. So. I, I was going to say Chicago just because I think Chicago is like yeah. probably the, I, I also think yeah. though, like they, they should, they could also take it to like, uh, to London as well. I think that would be like a big one. I think you could do one in one, you could do one in, in the States and then one in like London. And then you could probably do one in Japan too. I mean, right. Like that would be the most ideal. You could basically do like a three off. That'd be crazy thing, you know, yeah. like the old great American mega tours. events. Yeah. yeah. Like <laughs> yeah or i guess you could use either do or you could also do like once a year hosting in like those three places like what, about, yeah. what about what about what about this here we go every match is a best of three. Oh, <laughs> <That would be Just, laughs> <better. laughs> just keep taking it yeah yeah every <laughs> match is a best of three three right. different venues london chicago japan mm-hmm Except for that, you get the third, the third one. If someone's already won two out of the three, then you're screwed. They're not good. Clearly, <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. that can't happen. You can't book I it mean, that they way. could, but then you put I a mean, I don't even want to get into the booking of all that. Like that right, would right, make right. my mind melt. I mean, I'm the like, Clippers do it all the time. So I mean, it's yeah. just that. <laughs> that's true. So Baltimore is not going to get that big show. What we are going to get is Talking Shop Live. That's right. Here on June 13th, I have my ticket. I'm stoked. Super excited. We got all the Patreon folks coming in, which is exciting to begin with. So uh, yeah, if you want to fill us in on just what what to expect from that or even what how shenanigans that are going to happen. I mean, I mean, it. it's it's basically so we, we've had this Patreon community for just over a year now. Right. So mm-hmm. um, now, you know, we, we built this community. We started doing these things called boozing with the boys twice a month where you know, we, we would interact with everybody on, on Patreon to basically be like a big Zoom party, right? Every every week or every other week or whatever. So we, we made this community, we made this family, we've been talking to each other and for this this whole time through this, this crazy, you know, pandemic. And then now we're finally gonna have the big like blow off feud, you know, it's gonna be like, <laughs> we're all gonna get together and have like in person, which is insane and like just weird and crazy. And, uh, and we're actually just, we're going to, we're going to have a podcast. We're going to have uh, some special guests. Uh, and then there's probably going to be a lot of drinking and smoking of CBD and <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All, CBD dub. Yeah, all, all CBD. Dub. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. It's going to be uh, awesome. Like I'm oh, really excited for it. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I've been a member of the Patreon for a year right now since probably, I think since the beginning i think i've been in boozing with the boys since since the start so anyone listening like if yeah. you guys are not a part of this it's 100 percent worth it chris yeah you need in on this you're missing out i know i, <laughs> I tell you every time you gotta tell me every time but then you like recap for me and i feel like i don't have to it's like why watch the movie <laughs> when someone tells me all of the ending i, I give you what i can give you what happens right. in the patreon stays in the patreon this is, this in, is the truth yeah it's yeah there's <laughs> it's it pretty wild <laughs> yeah we don't we don't tattle <laughs> well, we, what no. i was gonna what i was gonna say is um I don't like to say like, it's always terrible to say with like the pandemic, like good things come out of the pandemic. But if you're not home, this, you know, if you're not going anywhere, this doesn't happen. No. You know, there, right. there is no boozing with the boys. There is, you know, like it's because mm-hmm. everyone was home and you decided, okay, we're all going to lose our minds. So yeah. we're going to do this thing where we just all drink on a Zoom call 
yeah. then it turns into this thing. So it's kind of like something good did come out of it. Right, right. No, yeah, 100%. And, and my wife and I are talking about this all the time. Like whenever we're, now we're like, obviously like we're starting to meet up with our friends and stuff in person, you know, that we haven't met up with in a while. And, uh, and it's always like a, re- like, that's the, the conversation you have, I feel like with everybody when you haven't seen them is like, well, what's been going on over the pandemic? You're like, like, where are you at? Are you, are, you know, are you, are you doing well? Are you not doing well? I mean, like there's, there's two sides to it. Right. And, and it's always mixed, you know? So, but like one thing that we always say, is like, yeah, we, you know, we started the, the podcast a couple of weeks before the shutdown and then the guys got fired and then it just spiraled into this whole thing. And then like, now we have this podcast that turned into this Patreon community. You know, we're like this little family, we hang out, like everybody knows each other. You know, like now we even have like, uh, you know, we have patrons who are making content for the other patrons. So like, it's really cool. So it, like, it, like, I don't know, it's, it's just, we wouldn't have had it with, you know, with the pandemic. There wouldn't, A, there wouldn't have been enough time. Nobody would have had time to do anything and like set it all up and nobody would have, and, who knows if they would if folks would have even showed up for Brisbane with the boys, but um, I mean, like I remember that first one was like hundreds of people, like oh, <laughs> so yeah. like it was like so many, you know, and then it kind of like dwindled down to like like the core group of people, but like in the beginning it was just like like we had Jericho in on like the second or third one, I feel like he came in, yeah, and big pop there, we had some, yeah, yeah, we AJ had was on one, right? Yeah, oh yeah, I forgot about AJ. AJ, AJ Ethan yeah. Page came and sat in on one for the. <laughs> Yeah. I, he couldn't believe it stay for the whole time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he was like what is <laughs> he would he doesn't even drink and he and he's he asks his like wife he's like can you get me those two beers that have been in the fridge for like a year <laughs> and she went and got him he drank them he like had the greatest time of his life like it's just fun yeah like it, like it, it really is a good time and uh like i said to to build the the relationships that we've had with everybody on there is is even better and then now it's going to, we're all going to meet each other in person live yeah. June 13th at, uh, at Jimmy's famous seafood in Baltimore. And it's on. It's going to yeah. be crazy. Like, it's wild. <laughs> like, it's so yeah. weird that we're going to be able to hang out with these people that we've seen on zoom for a so year weird. and feel like yeah. we've really gotten to know. I mean, yeah. hanging out with Rocky after dark, hanging out with you and oh, everyone yeah. sending you shot glasses and all the, <laughs> like, Man. we really, so, I mean, yeah. as, uh, on the other side of things as a patron, like we really feel like we've gotten to know you guys on a, on a different level that we wouldn't have been able to, uh, right. without this. So it's, it's been really, really cool. Um, aside from just creating these lasting friendships within the group. Right. Right. 100%. 100%. I mean, like it, it's crazy. Cause like, uh, one of our, our patrons, Jeremy, he was at the, uh, the Rus- WrestleMania WrestleCon, uh, mm-hmm. thing, you know, and, and uh, I had met him before in person, like back in, like in Miami in 2020, but like, this is all pre talking shop and pre Patreon and uh, just like interacting with him, like in person, like, dude, are we like hugging each other. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, this is crazy. I can't believe I'm seeing you in person. This is so weird. Like, I, I don't like, I didn't even like, I know you so well, I feel like, and I, but we've never actually like, we've never like really, really like interacted in person, you know? So like, I'm just so, so weird. I can't, I can't wait. I'm looking yeah. forward to it. I know Jimmy's is going to be, Chris, there's like, I think 20 of us, at least at this point that are all on there that I think we're just going to show up and it's just going to be the wildest party. Yeah. And then Jimmy's yeah, is my home party. base. I'm good friends with John, the owner and right. my band's played there. And that's just one of my spots. And you got a show too, right? Like the night before. Yeah. Yeah, That's so sick. Gallows was asking me what time it was. I'm like, yeah. what is? I'm going to try to, we're, we're going to try to go, I think, if we can. Be, that would be awesome. Yeah, we nope. had a booking, but I think it fell through, so <laughs> it might be work out. Yeah, get you guys up so- up on stage, sing a song. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like you're going to debut that song sooner than you thought, Rocky. Right. I <laughs> you know, hope you're ready. Play we'll the, the track, track Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> Just got the the good brother summer track just ready to go. Right, all words. Absolutely, and, debut yeah. it for the Patreon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, awesome, Rock. Thank you so much for joining us oh, thanks, today man. on the podcast. Appreciate it's been it. awesome. I cannot wait. So, what we're two weeks out, two yeah. weeks from yesterday at Jimmy Seafood. So, June already. Huh? I know. Right. June already. Yeah, June. No. June tomorrow. No. Um, tell people where they can get tickets to talking shop yeah uh go to tnsmania.com 
and uh, and you can click the link. It's like LPWG. It's I don't know. It's where Gallows Lariato does, Pro. Yeah, Lariato thing. Pro Wrestling. Yeah. Take it. <laughs> thing i don't know but yeah go to tnsmania.com and, and there'll be a link on there cool awesome and then where people can find you uh follow or- me at azuka rock a-z-u-c-a-r-r-o-c on twitter and on instagram uh check out my spotify uh music you can get everything there and apple music of course the podcast talk and shop available on all podcasting platforms and uh watch me every friday night on njpwworld.com, New Japan Strong. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks, man. Thank you.